Good morning, Redwood. Uh, my name is Tyler. Some of you might remember me. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we've been in a sermon rotation with the other uh, campus pastors talking through the characters of Christmas. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the adversaries to Advent, the bad guys. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, we had Austin talk about ordinary shepherds. Uh, last week, I heard there was a real-life magi here in the flesh, a real wise guy, right? And <laughs> don't amen. But uh, as we get closer and closer to Christmas, we're zooming in on the uh, more central characters. So today we're going to look at the parents of Christmas. But before we dive in, as we saw in the weekly, can you believe that Redwood Campus has been around for five years? We're going to have our five-year birthday party. Uh, And so that'll be next week, December 29th, potluck after this service. So bring some some goodies and we're going to have a good celebration. We're going to have some cake and just celebrate all that God has done in the five years here as as our campus. And of course, Tuesday, Christmas Eve services. Some of you saw that there were candy canes on your seats. These were not snacks to get you through the sermon. Uh, These are actually to uh, invite people to the Christmas Eve services, 3.30 and 5 here at Redwood. And if if 2 o'clock is more convenient for you, there is the downtown and Rogue River option. And so I want you to pray about it. Even let's do that right now. Let's just think about maybe someone that God might want you to invite to those services if you're going to be in town. Let's take a moment to pray and uh, ask God to uh, bring some people to mind, perhaps. Father, even now we're uh, just thinking of of you and your son and uh, all that you've done for us as represented in the Christmas season. And We pray that you might bring people to mind, even right now in this moment of silence, that you might have us uh, give one of these cards to, one of these candy canes to, and invite them to the Christmas Eve service with us. Lord, thanks for this moment, this opportunity to gather this morning. Uh, We thank you for the the kids that just sang for us. We pray for each and every one of them that they would uh, grow to embody the things that they they sang, that they would uh, come to know you at the earliest possible age if they don't already. And uh, Lord, for us this morning, would you uh, speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're in Matthew 1, verse 18. This will be on the screen, too, if you uh, don't have your Bible. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And they gave him, he gave him the name, Jesus. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. For many of us, the Christmas story is really familiar. We've heard it over and over again. Who feels that way? A few of us, you want to come teach on Christmas Eve? Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's very familiar and sentimental. We can look at the story. We can look at nativity sets like this one on the screen. And just, it just feels so sentimental. I mean, look at the little lambs. Just looking at and enjoying the happy, not crying baby Jesus on the silent night. You've got the angels there and the star. It just looks like a good, happy night. And it seems a little bit like a fairy tale, dreamlike, surreal. And I mean, no doubt there's something very special and significant happening that night. But this is childbirth. It's chaotic, stressful. Uh, terrifying, dangerous. Many of you uh, ladies have been there. Uh, more than that, this is childbirth in ancient Israel. Mary has a 2 to 3% chance of dying in this childbirth. The baby has a 30% chance of dying before his 14th birthday. 
So this Christmas story is not disconnected from reality. Blood, sweat, tears, shrieks of pain. But it costs more than just physical pain to bring this baby into the world. He's born into a culture, a family, a social situation, an unearned reputation. Like your family and mine, this baby has baggage. He's born into baggage. And so here's our big idea today. The Christmas story ruins three reputations, but results in restoration. Three ruined reputations. Three people put it all on the line and in some ways are irreparably tainted because of their connection with Jesus. But they'd never take it back. And in particular, as I give this sermon, I think of maybe some of you who, for whom the holiday season is difficult. It's hard. It's sad for whatever reason. And I have prayed for you. I have prayed that this teaching would, I guess, it might help you realize that the Christmas story is more relatable than you've thought. More real life, more complicated, more painful, and yet more hopeful in light of that. So, three ruined reputations. First, of course, is Mary, right? Mary. Uh, I've asked Anna Grace to be Mary. Anna Grace, you want to come on up? So Mary is probably about 14 years old. And how old are you, Anna Grace? Four, wow, look at this. So uh, females matured earlier than in the modern day uh, students, uh, marrying anywhere from 13 to 17 back then. Can you imagine being married right now? Parents, can you imagine her being married? No, they're, they're scared. One day an angel shows up to Mary, telling her she's going to be pregnant. Can you guys see Mary? Sort of. Uh, why don't you step uh, here in the front, Anna Grace? And uh, the angel tells her she's going to have the promised king. She's going to be pregnant, out of wedlock, by the Holy Spirit. No sexual intercourse, just as the Holy Spirit is involved in creation, kind of hovering over the water, so the Holy Spirit is involved in this new creation at work in her. This is, uh, just as God creates the world out of nothing, so the Holy Spirit creates this out of nothing, outside and apart from the normal human reproductive process. Very important. And Mary is more than willing to be the channel of God's redemptive activity, new uh, life. And she says, I'm the Lord's servant. May it do to me as uh, your word says. In other words, let's do this. <laughs> Mary surrenders to God, but I don't think this is a soft-spoken, contemplative a uh, pensive woman like we see in the, the paintings, the church paintings. No, I think this is a, uh, a woman with a lot of courage, a lot of excitement, a lot of uh, hope. If you're a 14-year-old under Roman oppression, poor and ready for a new government, and you're told your son is going to be the king, the Messiah, I think you'd be ready to talk. Eh? This 14-year-old girl realizes she's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with King Herod, and every other evil, demonic empire. If we read her song, the Magnificat, we see it has more teeth than most worship songs. She's willing, ready, and excited. Is she perfect? Is she perfect, mom and dad? No. Is she, uh, will she fully understand the mission of her son? No. But she has given herself to be used by God. This will cost her greatly. It will cost her everything. Because who's going to believe this story? Would you? I, I wouldn't believe this story. Um, and so she can hide it for a little while. But in a small town, the, the whispers and rumors start to spread like wildfire. Think of the Josephine County Scanner Chat Facebook group, right? <laughs> Just rumors flying everywhere. Many of us can relate to a ruined reputation. Maybe it was your fault. Maybe you were falsely accused or lied about or slandered. People didn't have the whole picture or the whole story. We were misunderstood or maybe it's a combination of the two. And, and in this, we can sort of relate to Mary. But we don't really have a concept of how deep the honor-shame culture goes in the ancient world. This is uh, an honor-shame culture, which means the most important things in life are getting honor and avoiding dishonor. To keep your reputation solid and do whatever you can to uh, stay, have, to have that good reputation. It's very, very important. Because your reputation doesn't only impact you, it's going to affect your family. It's going to affect 
everyone around you, your tribe, your church, your, uh, your city. It's going to reflect everybody. See, one honorable accomplishment or one foolish mistake can follow your family for centuries. It can ruin uh, your grandkids' lives, if you will. One of the worst parts of an honor-shame culture is the kind of um, honor killings or vengeance that can happen to try and get that honor or credibility back. But despite all this, Mary here endures her cross, despising the shame for the joy set before her. She doesn't worry about her reputation with others, joyfully trusting God. It says she treasures all this in her heart. And do you know what's ironic? So this pregnancy outside of wedlock will make her one of the most despised people in town. And yet, 2,000 years later, how does most of the world view Mary? She's one of the most honored persons in human history. I mean, after Jesus, I wonder if there's anyone more venerated than Mary. And sometimes this even goes into worship and idolatry, which is not good. But it does go to show us how, how great she really is, how, in, how amazing uh, she was. Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts herself will be humbled. Whoever humbles herself will be exalted. And apparently so. Let's give it up for Mary. Nice job. Well, the second person to suffer, to have a harmed reputation because of Christmas is, of course, Joseph. Joseph. Let's remind ourselves that this couple is already low on the social ladder. They're very poor. We know this because they go to give the sacrifice when they have Jesus. They go to dedicate him to the Lord. And um, if you were rich or middle class, you would offer a lamb or a goat or a sheep. But they're poor, so they offer birds. Luke 2.22, Joseph and Mary took the baby to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and offer a sacrifice in keeping what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So Joseph, he's already trying to make ends meet for his new wife-to-be. He's engaged, which actually the, the, the biblical word is betrothed, would have been actually stronger than engagement. You're legally married, but you haven't had the ceremony yet and you haven't consummated yet. So that's the state of their relationship. And uh, Joseph's probably about 18 around this time. Who, who wants to be Joseph? Chris, you want to be Joseph? Come on up, man. I'll, we got Chris here. How old are you, Chris? 19, perfect. So Joseph, probably around 18, he would have been called a Sadiq, a righteous person. Uh, he's faithful to God's law, loves the Bible, and he has a great reputation, good character, the kind of guy anyone would want for their daughter, right? Amen? <laughs> so lots going for him. So picture one night after work, Joseph is, uh, you know, sitting with his buddies around the fire, having a good time, hanging out. Maybe they're complaining about Roman taxes. And then one, uh, all of a sudden, a friend runs up. And the friend proceeds to tell Joseph that his fiancée is pregnant. Because Joseph is a righteous, upright man, he immediately goes to the Old Testament, a text he knows very well, and he knows the options. This is definitely not his kid. And so he realizes there's really only two options. One, Mary cheated on him with another man in which case she's an adulteress and he must divorce her. In fact, she could even suffer capital punishment for this crime, although that was rarely enforced back then. So that's option one. The second option is that she's been raped by a Roman soldier. And this was actually an early Jewish myth on uh, Mary's pregnancy. So Joseph wonders who has done what, what has happened. But either way, he's been disgraced, dishonored, his reputation slandered or, or hurt because his fiancée is now pregnant and he's not responsible. So he enters kind of this damage control mode. Uh, how can the situation, situation be rectified with the least amount of carnage for everyone around us? So he goes to bed, he's really distressed, and he realizes what he has to do. He's, he realizes he's going to divorce her quietly. This is something of a compassionate move because he doesn't want to go public with this and disgrace her family in public, but he has to divorce her because of the shame and stigma that she brings to his family. So after tossing and turning, uh, Joseph finally falls asleep. I fall asleep, Joseph. <laughs> An angel comes to Joseph in a dream, and it's as if the angel says this to, to old Joe here. Uh, Joe, I know you follow Torah, 
I know you love God, and I know your reputation is going to be ruined. Your status is going to be trashed, but this is what God has for your life. Uh, take Mary as your wife and this baby as your son. And so amazingly, graciously, compassionately, Joseph, at great cost to his social status, resumes his relationship with Mary. And then in verse 25, it tells us that Joseph names the new baby. The fact that Joseph names him and not Mary shows that he is legally adopting him as his own son and taking him. As, it's as if he's saying, this is my son who I love and whom I'm well pleased, no matter what everyone else is saying. So for Joseph, Christmas was the day he lost his reputation the day he began to suffer to be connected with Jesus and Mary. And we wish we knew more about Joseph. You know how many words Joseph says in the Bible? Zero. He's a man of few words, like Chris. He doesn't say much, and we don't know much, and by the time Jesus is ministering, he is gone. He's probably died. So we don't know what kind of father he's like, or his story, or what kind of husband he was, but we do recognize that there's this honor of being entrusted to teach and train and work with the Son of God. Pretty cool, huh? Thanks, Chris. Nice job. Well, there's a third person whose reputation takes a hit, a third parent who gives up everything. And by third parent, I'm referring to God the Father. Now, I won't call up Doc to represent God the Father, you know, but because uh, that, that would be idolatrous or something. Uh, but we do have, even at the early age of 12 years old, we see Jesus calling God Father, which wasn't very common in Jewish circles. See, Jews typically prayed with many titles of reverence, like King, Master, Lord, uh, Sovereign. And Jesus is no less reverent, but he's also very familiar. In fact, he's so familiar with God that He'll say things like, I and the Father are one, to the terror of those listening, to, to the religious leaders. It made him very uncomfortable. But it's obvious that Jesus shares this unique, special relationship with God. And the only way we can kind of try and grasp it is the idea of father and son. Uh, not a biological relationship, because there was never a time that Jesus was not. It's a relational relationship, so close that it's like, a father and son. Scripture calls it, the, uh, Christian theology calls us the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, one God, three persons. A wonderful Christmas mystery. Uh, so the father too, like the parents, puts everything on the line, risking and even in a sense ruining his reputation in the Christmas story. We see this in three ways, real quick. Scandalous associations, shameful affirmations, and uh, discouraged expectations. So first, scandalous associations. The Gospel of Matthew starts with riveting reading. I'm talking very exciting stuff, genealogies. So your Ancestry.com uh, profile of Jesus. And, you know, most of the time we don't really know how to read this stuff. We skip it. We're not sure what to do. But as many of you have seen before, this genealogy has some interesting things going on in it, particularly the four women that it highlights. In a male-dominated culture, the fact that these women are here just jumps off the scrolls to us. And so, uh, real quick, I'm going to summarize these four women. They're not Sunday school teachers, okay? Uh, we wouldn't allow them to work with our Sunday school students yet. Uh, but here's what's going on. So first we have Tamar. Childless Tamar disguises herself as a prostitute, seduces her father-in-law, Judah, to have children. And secondly, there's Rahab. Uh, Rahab is a prostitute in the city of Jericho who harbors and protects Israel's spies, and so she survives. Then third, there's Ruth, the Moabite. The Moabite people begin from an incestuous encounter with Lot and his oldest daughter in a cave. So uh, Ruth has a pretty good reputation, it seems like, but her associations with the Moabites and a strange, mysterious encounter with her future husband, her future husband uh, just kind of gives us a weird vibe about her. Uh, then there's uh, Uriah's wife in verse 6, Bathsheba. David summons a married woman to his bed. We're not sure how consensual this is. And she gets pregnant, and he has her husband killed. You thought your family had problems. <laughs> These are Jesus' great-great-grandparents. 
These women all have shameful reputations involving sex. They're all probably foreigners as well, not Jewish. And these are the four, uh, and these are just the four women. We could mention the 42 guys on that list who were just as bad, if not worse, than the ladies, but we have to mention the women because of how countercultural their inclusion is. Well, why do I share this? The father's reputation is dragged through the mud by being identified with these people. And he doesn't care. He happily identifies with the messed up, the broken down, the flawed, and the sinful. Uh, more than this, he, he uses them. He uses them to bring his son to the world. He affirms them. He loves them. In fact, we see Jesus doing the same thing. Like father, like son, in who he eats with. Sinners and tax collectors. So the father has scandalous associations. There's also shameless affirmation. Many of us are familiar with the prodigal son story. Probably Jesus is most fav uh, famous. Uh, a son tells his father, give me my inheritance. An incredibly dishonoring statement that was pretty much saying, I wish you were dead, dad. Uh, and any self-respecting man in the first century would have punished his son severely for speaking this way. But to the horror of everyone listening to Jesus' story, the father sells a third of his land, land that had been in the family line for centuries, and gives the money to his son. Then the, the son goes to the Vegas of the day, quickly burning through all the money, partying, prostitutes, drugs, gambling. He soon runs out of money, needs a job, and starts being a servant who works with pigs one of the worst jobs a young Jewish man could have. Uh, one day, he's hungry and depressed and realizes that his father's servants are a lot bet better treated than he is, and he wonders, man, if I go home and beg my father on my knees, maybe he'll make me a slave in his family. That would be better than this. So he goes back home. But while he's a long way off, walking the long driveway, the father sees him. Filled with compassion, he runs to him, throws his arms around his neck, kisses his son, he welcomes him home as a son, not as a slave, and he throws a fat party. He says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, let's kill the calf and have a celebration, my lost son is home. For most of us, our heart's feeling kind of warm right now, you know, but the ancient listeners would have been very offended by this story, uh, infuriated, the story shatters categories. The father's response is ridiculous, enabling, shameful. He looks like a fool. In the ancient world, wealthy, distinguished men don't run. Be like seeing a, a man in a suit running. Uh, that only happens in airports, you know. Uh, today, or back then, only slaves and servants would run. Plus, the father has been severely dishonored by his younger son and does nothing to get it back. No earning back his credibility. No tipping the scales back or no desire to regain his lost credibility or finances. But the father's not done being disgraced. See, there's another son, the older brother. He's fuming out back when he finds out what happens. So the father goes out to him, begging him to come in. And the older brother, his son, says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed you and you've never given me anything. But when that son of yours come, comes home, you throw him a party? Again, in a culture of respect and deference to elders, this response, look, is extremely disrespectful, very much out of bounds. And I, again, imagine those listening to the story and they're very conflicted at this point. Because on the one hand, the father looks foolish and and the older brother is the first person to call him out in this story. But on the other hand, he's still the son, and he still has disgraced his father. And so the listeners wonder if maybe he'll finally grow a spine, the father, and disown his son. But no, to the amazement of all the listeners, the father says, My son, despite how you've insulted me publicly, uh, I still want you at the feast. I will not disown you, but I don't want to disown your brother either. Please swallow your pride and come into the feast. And as Jesus tells this story, he's pointing to his own father, to this fictional father. 
his own father who celebrates when you and I come back home, who uh, grieves when we're separated from him, whether by actions or by our heart. The father looks foolish because his grace and his welcome to each and every one of us who comes to him is so wide open. Finally, the father's reputation is seemingly damaged by discouraged expectations. If you ever read the Old Testament, we see that God promises a lot. He makes a lot of promises. A new world, a rebuilt Jerusalem, the overthrowing of evil, corrupt governments, justice, restoration. In particular, he promises that a future king is going to pull this off. And then Jesus shows up. And people start to get excited because there's some ways that he looks a lot like a king. He, he's, he's, very, uh, he's very charismatic. He's got great speeches. He can draw a crowd. And then he starts healing people. And then he starts like making a lot of food out of not a lot of food. You know, that's very king-like. But, but then there's other areas that he's not very king-like. Like no army. No secret seditious meetings. No justice, no plan, no political overhaul. And after a while, people start having doubts about Jesus, including his most legendary hype man and cousin, John the Baptizer. This guy has been thrown into prison for calling out Herod. John is approaching execution, and Jesus is walking around telling people to love their enemies. And John is very discouraged. See, Jesus' approach seems to undercut most of the Old Testament that promises this kind of kick-butt king. And it's not happening. And so John sends his disciples to talk to Jesus. Uh, Matthew eleven two. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who's to come? Or should we expect someone else? That's pretty crazy. Deep doubt from one of the greatest biblical heroes. Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Because it doesn't really look like it. It doesn't really feel like it. All those promises God made, it doesn't really feel like you're an answer to them. feels like God's reputation isn't faithful. Right now, I'm about to get killed. Jesus sends him back encouragement and a minor critique to his cousin, saying something like, this is my paraphrase, but... John, the kingdom is breaking in. Be patient and don't be ashamed that my path looks different from that which you've expected. I will do far more than you realize. I'm not just overthrowing Herod and Rome. I'm overthrowing sin and Satan. Well, what does all this show us? The father ruined his reputation. The son ruined his reputation. Mary and Joseph ruined their reputation to give us a new one to give us a fresh start, a renewed reputation, a new status as sons and daughters. Colossians 1.11, we pray that you would be strengthened, says Paul, with all his glorious power. So you will have the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He's enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. That inheritance language in verse 12, that should remind us back to the prodigal son story, I think, or at least have some connection to it. God is not ashamed by us. He's not embarrassed by us. He's fully invested in us and writes us in his will. And how much does God own? Everything. It's all his, and we get to join him in that. Hebrews 2.11, both the one who makes people holy, Jesus, And those who are holy, us as Christians, are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And then Hebrews 12, 6, with the Father, Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So if you've received Jesus, God welcomes you into his family. And this invitation is for all of us. Ancient church father Athanasius said this, and it's going to sound weird until I clarify but it's beautiful. He says, the son of God became man so that man might become God. And by this, Athanasius did not mean that we become God in the sense of substance or that we'll deserve worship. There's only or ever one God, one creator, uh, 
But what, the, what Athanasius is saying, probably in a way differently than we would say it, is something like this. Christ became what we are so we could become what he is. He joins our family so then we can join his family. The marvelous exchange. He enters our life so we might enter his. And I think this is what First Peter, Second Peter 1, 4 says. God has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you might participate in the divine nature. So we get so close to God, so brought into his family, so close to him at the dinner table that, it, that we start to look like Jesus. We start to look like his son. Behold the God who bankrupts heaven, who gives us his greatest gift and harms his reputation so you and I can have a new reputation. Let's pray.